morning, people of God. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church in Loveland, Colorado this morning. I am Reverend Leslie Wood. Uh, Reverend Lee is not feeling well this morning, so she is, she is taking a day to rest, and we, we send her some healing mer mercies as we pray this morning and send positive thoughts, so we'll welcome her. I hope we welcome her back next week because she's supposed to preach, so... Yeah, so we'll pray really hard. So uh, welcome, everyone. If you're here in the sanctuary, you are a sight for sore eyes, if, as always. If you're worshiping with us online, we are so grateful you are with us. We are a body of Christ, a community of faith together. So welcome, everyone. I just have a couple of announcements. Well, three or four announcements this morning. Uh, one, Matthew, you want to come on and make your way forward for yours? Matthew's going to give a little announcement here in the morning. Um, I did want to no note for those of you who have signed up for the How to Care class, I'm sure you heard, but it had to be postponed since Lee's not feeling well. Uh, and it's been postponed to October 5th. The details are in the window. And I'm thinking that that probably means that there's time for more sign-ups. So if there's anybody who wanted to sign up and felt like you missed the, missed the window, well, October 5th is the new time. That's a Saturday, and I believe it's from 9 until 2 uh, that Saturday. So uh, check with Lee and send your interest in if you haven't signed up yet and you would like to. Um, right after service today is our FUMC 101 class, talking and getting to know us a lot. Well, it's supposed to be getting to know Lee and I, but getting to know me a little bit more and, uh, and also getting to know what's going on here, who we are here at this church, and in the greater UMC. So that's right after the service. Yeah, probably start around 11:30, but it's in West Coy, just on the edge of Coy Hall. There, if you did not register, that's okay. Just come on and stop in. We'd love to see you, especially if you are a a guest or a visitor. It's open to everybody, but we'd love to see you if if you're um, a visitor, whether it's your first time or you've been here many times. You're welcome to come. So. Uh, we have a very special event coming up on Thursday. It's our monthly Women's Fellowship Thursday, except this time it's a little bit different. This time we actually are going to have a production. The Good Samaritan Village Players will be here. Our own Jim Willard has written a... Oh, vignettes, I guess, is, is the proper, maybe, artsy term for that. Uh, he had titled it, Ah, oh, Yes, I Remember It Well. It is a reader's theater script, and uh, it will be folks who live and call Good Samaritan home, including two of our own, Barb Ireland and Barry Worley. They are cast members, uh, and it will be here in the sanctuary. And it starts at 12.15. So remember that, it's the quarter hour, 1215 here in the sanctuary, and everyone is invited. You do not have to be a woman. So <laughs> please come and, and uh, enjoy this wonderful script that Jim wrote and enjoy our friends and, and make new ones on Thursday afternoon. Um, well, our altar flowers, see how pretty they are? They're for a very special occasion. It is Rick and Galene West's 45th wedding anniversary. So, yes, a very big applause for that and wish them a very happy anniversary. Uh, where I saw you both. I know Rick's back there. Anyway, wherever you are, where are you, Galene? I knew you'd be there one, and I, I was, okay. Galene and Rick, happy anniversary. Um, now I'm going to let Matthew speak for just a moment. Next month is our annual Trunk or Treat event, so I wanted to announce a few things about that. So October 27th, this church, Trinity United Methodist Church, and our combined union ministries will be hosting our annual Trunk or Treat and Chili Cook-Off. Again, it is October 27th. From 2 to 4 p.m. is the actual event. However, if you sign up to bring a trunk, please be here by 1. So from you, we will need trunks, people to sign up to bring trunks, and we need candy. We provide the candy for our trunks, and we will have a donation bucket for our candy next week. All sign-ups will also be on the Ask Me desk to bring a trunk. After Trunk or Treat here, there will be a chili cook-off at Trinity. You can also sign up to bring a chili on the Ask Me desk, or you can sign up to bring sides, cheese, sour cream, desserts, something like that, also on the Ask Me desk. So I look forward to Trunk or Treat, and I hope everyone could participate. 
And yeah, I wanted to get the word out early. More information can be found in the window, or you could talk to me directly. Thank you. I'm sure everybody knows what a trunk is, but just in case, if you're, you're new here, it means the trunk of your car. And uh, a lot of people decorate and make their cars look all interesting for Halloween, whatever that means to you. So um, I know that the youth and the union ministry would love to have you, uh, and the children's ministry would love to have you um, participate this year. That is all I have this morning. I invite us all, our eye in the sky is is right here, and it's that shift. We're going to pass the peace of Christ to one another. It's not pointing at you yet. It's still looking at the choir. So uh, wait, waiting to see it spin. But as soon, soon as it gets spun, I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to your... Oh, what's going on? It's... Oh, that camera is on them? Okay, then you're going to have to turn around and look at that camera. So go ahead and stand as you're able. Wave to our folks online. If you're online, I know you're waving back. And please turn to your neighbors and pass the peace of Christ wherever you are right now. <laughs> it wasn't working. It wasn't. No, I, I saw it come up and I thought maybe they got it fixed because it's not working. Okay, as we're all getting settled, I invite you, if you're here in the sanctuary or if you're worshiping from somewhere else online, I invite you to take this moment to start settling yourself on your outsides just as you're settling yourself on your inside. Uh, we always like to start, I always like to start us by just giving us a moment of, of centering. So I invite you to take a deep breath. You're welcome to close your eyes if you'd like. And we're going to sit in silence for just a brief moment, a breath or two, as we allow our spirits to connect with God's spirit. Let us go to God in silence, and then I will begin with a word of prayer. Let us be in silence. Great spirit God, thank you for drawing us here and for being here with us. We give you thanks for another day on this earth. We give you thanks for this day to enjoy the compassionate goodness of you, our creator. And we acknowledge with one mind our respect and gratefulness to all the sacred cycles of life. Bind us together in the circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and one another. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and sing our opening song. It is God who stretched the spangled heavens. You will find it if you want to follow along in the hymnal on page 150150. The words will be on your screen.
please remain standing. God gathers us a prayer from Bishop Alwyn De Silva, Auxiliary Bishop of Bombay, Mumbai, India. Come, O holy breath of God, poured out for us. Along with the earth, we ask you to free us from greed, selfishness, and indifference. Along with the air, the water, the land, and the wind, we ask you to help us get rid of all the pollution. Along with the forests, birds, and animals, give us the strength not to destroy ourselves and the delicate webs that connect our ecosystems and our all life together. Along with those in power and positions of authority, we ask for wisdom to be good stewards of our common home. Along with the whole of creation and peoples, we give you thanks for all the efforts to restore our Mother Earth. Amen. The children, please come forward for the children's worship time. Good morning, Dean. Good morning. So I wasn't sure if I was doing children's sermon or not today, so this one's kind of out of my back pocket, okay? Is that cool? So what did you see when you were coming to church this morning that was coming from the sky? Raining. It was raining, yes. It was raining this morning. Did you have some puddles? Uh, yes. Yeah, me too. So that kind of made me start thinking about water and how water is so, so, so important to the earth and to people. And then I started thinking about, do you know how much water we use? In, like if when we do normal things, what do you use water for at your house? What's something you do? Drink. You drink water, good, good. Keep drinking water, that's important. Have you ever taken a shower? Like uh, two or three f times. Yeah, do you normally take baths? Yeah, I was so scared of showers. Well, I get that, dude. I get that. So, you know, if you are taking a bath in the bathtub, do you know how many gallons of water that takes? Give me a guess. I do not know. Oh, come on. Give me a guess. Uh, like 13. Ooh, good guess. It's actually 40. 40 gallons of water. Do you know how much gallons of water it takes to take a shower? Do you think it'd be less than a bath or more? Uh, more. You're right. 50 gallons to take a shower. That's a lot, huh? Yes. Yeah. Do you know if you just um, brush your teeth, pretend we're brushing our teeth, okay, and we leave the water running while we brush our teeth because we're kind of lazy and we don't want to turn it off, do you know how much water that takes? Uh, like 60 or something? It takes two whole gallons of water. Two whole gallons. So we use water all the time, right? I know. Just knocks you over. Yeah. So do you know that there are places in the world where people don't have clean water? Did you know that? I did not know that. It is the truth. There are lots of places in the world where they don't have clean water. In America... We use about 500 gallons of water a day. 500? Yeah, for each, yeah. So a 500 gallons a day, which is a lot, okay? But do you know that in a place called Honduras, they use nine? Only nine? I know, only nine. Because they don't have so much water. 
And in a place in Canada, I mean, not in Canada. In Canada, they actually use more than us. They use like 200 gallons. Aha. But I know, I know. But in Kenya, in Africa, they use 13 gallons. That's all they have. Only 13? Yeah. They don't have much water. And do you know that they have to walk to go get their water? Yeah, a lot of places in Africa, a lot of the countries there, they don't have so much water. So the moms and the girls go out in the morning and they put some big old jugs on their head up here and they walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. They walk an average of three and a half miles a day. Three and a half. Yeah, three and a half miles is a long way just to get water. So we are so, so lucky. We just go and turn it on the faucet, right? Yes. Yeah. So easy. But they don't get to do that. And one of the things that we need to do is remember that we kind of have, we have a job to do to take care of the earth. Because God said that we're the stewards of the earth, which means that we're supposed to help take care of it. And one of the ways we can help take care of it is by making sure we don't waste a bunch of water and we take care of the water that we have. And we might need to help some of those people in the other parts of the earth that don't have so much water to get some clean water. Do you think that sounds like a good idea? Yes. Thanks, Dean. So, you know, there's something coming up next week. On Sunday, we're doing the crop walk. And the, one of the sayings of the crop walk is that we walk because all those other people around the world have to walk just to go get water for a day. Like, use their cars to go get water? Some of them don't even have cars, baby. Yeah, yeah. I know. Then they don't live in a place where there's roads for cars either. So it's really different around the world. So next Sunday, we're going to do a crop walk, and we're going to be walking for those people who have to walk and walk and walk to go get their water. Because Jesus said, hey, do you love me? And his disciples said, of course I love you, Jesus. He said, then take care of my friends. Take care of the earth. Take care of each other. Do you think we can do that? Yes. Awesome. Let's say a prayer, okay? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the clean water that we have. And we pray that we might work together for others on this earth to have clean water too. And all God's children said? Amen. Good job. Thanks, Dean.
Gorgeous, gorgeous offering. Thank you, choir. I also want to thank Sarah for her children's sermon because I completely forgot to mention the crop walk last week. So I apologize, Sarah, and I love the way you wove it in. Maybe you were planning on it anyway, but uh, if you have not signed up to walk, it is a wonderful way to be a part of caring for God's, the people of God's good creation because we are all part of that. Uh, if you can't walk, but want to support, just see, well, see the one of them, James or Sarah Cleggern, and either sign up or, or um, they, they will take donations or tell you how to give donations or, or whatever. So that is, that is a good way to serve. Uh, let us go to God now as the people of God in prayer. God of all creatures, great and small, we come before you where we are right now. Some feel small, some feel great, but we know that in your eyes we are all equal. You see each of us, care for each of us, and you see that each of us is capable of great things. Thank you for empowering us to do the good that you call us to do. You have entrusted us with a precious gift when you called us to care for your creation. It is with both humility and hope that we praise you. We have failed to see the earth as sacred, O God. This planet is a holy place, but we have not treated it as such. It is in this holy place now that we return to you and your calling on us. We come before you in this time of deepening social and climate crisis to confess our complicity and inaction, to pray for those most severely affected, and to ask for the courage and perseverance to be diligent in prayer and seeking truth in allowing ourselves to be transformed and in acting with spirit-led wisdom for the good of our human and non-human siblings. Hear us, gracious God. We confess that we have wasted and polluted water, the drink of life, and main substance in our bodies. We have polluted and poisoned and abused the soil and the air and ravaged the land. We have caused the deaths of so many animals and insects. Have mercy on us, merciful God. May we see once again that the earth is sacred, a holy place where you dwell, that we may have a renewed and restored relationship to all of creation, we pray. Hear us, O God of life. For we pray this in the name of the one who revealed the sacredness of the common and the humble, Jesus, our Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture today is Mark 9, 38 through 50 from the New International Version. Whoever is not against us is for us. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Causing to stumble. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. 
It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Please stand for the hymn of anticipation, number 3033 in the black hymnal, God of Great and God of Small, and the choir will lead us on this. The words are on the back of your, that's okay. These are new and we don't have quite enough hymnals for everyone. So follow the choir. The words are on the back and on the screen and share your green hymnals. There was in stereo going on, so I'm impressed. Very, very good. Did y'all listen to that scripture? It's one of those that kind of make you feel a little icky, to be honest. So let's talk about it a little bit. And we're going to start today with a little anthropology and a little history, which is a little different than I normally do. But, but here we go. You know, if you read my pastor's pondering a couple of weeks ago, you might remember that I mentioned briefly mitochondrial Eve. Now, some anthropologists, some historians believe that every human being, every human being currently living, descended from a single female who lived 200,000 years ago in Africa. Now, they are not claiming, and no, this is not the Genesis Eve, this wasn't the first female, nor was she the only female. Scientists have just named her after the biblical first female in creation. And all of us, they say, have a piece of her DNA inside of us. Think about that. Now, based on my itsy-bitsy understanding of humanity's development, about 100,000 or so years later, Hominids, pre-homo sapiens, began to migrate from Africa. They moved northeast and they crossed into what is now the Middle East and on into the area that makes up southern Europe. Some moved northwest into the area of today's greater Europe where they mixed and they met and they mingled with Neanderthals and became the ancestors of people of European descent. The migration continued. Some moved far to the east into territories that would become India 
and Asia, and even further down south into Australia. Some went far north into today's Russia and made their way all the way to the area of the Bering Sea. And then about 30,000 years ago, ever moving, the people there began to cross the Bering Strait, that landmass that used to connect our continents and made their way into what is now Alaska, down into Canada, and then on down into North America, then South America. All this migration and evolution of the species happened over thousands and thousands of years. The evolving humans moved because they needed to survive. They were hunters and gatherers, and so expansive land was necessary in order for them to keep finding edible and medicinal plants and prey to provide food and clothing and materials for sheltering. And as the people moved, they formed tribes. Now, a tribe ensured security in numbers. And they would move and they would settle in an area and they would defend it from other tribes. They would fight. They would close ranks. They would tell members of those other tribes who tried to move in on their territory, you're not wanted here. You're not one of us. You need to move on. So after a skirmish and battles, those other tribes, they would then move on to find their own land to rely upon and defend. And eventually this happened all over the globe. Now, why all this history and anthropology this morning? Well, as I was research for, researching for the message this week, I thought of the title of Isabel Wilkerson's book on racism that came out just a few years ago, I think in 2020. She titled it The Origins of Our Discontent. How many of you have read that or seen it or heard of it? I remember hearing of it. I have not read it. Now, racism is a serious issue. But it's not the only one issue. It is one of many issues of many things that we managed to find to be discontented about. And it, I remember it. I recalled the title. And it seems to me that the origins of our discontent may go back at least as far as all those migrating tribes. Reverend Brian McLaren points out these different tribes developed different ways of painting, of tattooing their bodies, of styling their hair, of fashioning their clothing, etc., all as a means to identify themselves as belonging to a certain tribe. They were tribal markers. And there was another important marker that identified them. It was religion. Now, when the people of these tribes, when they would circle around a stone idol, idol and they would sing the same songs and follow the same rituals and dance the same dances and, and tell the same stories, they would develop this certain cohesion, this tightness as a group that gave them a survival advantage over other tribes. There is something very powerful about a shared faith and religious beliefs. Now, all this is interesting, or at least it is to me, but it is also enough to make us feel a bit yucky, a bit uneasy, if we're honest, because who wants to dilute our Christian faith, our Christianity, down to just some sort of tribal marker? Who wants to distill our faith down to songs and rituals and dances and stories that mark us as belonging to a certain tribe? What's more, a tribe that must be strengthened and defended and justified over and against other tribes. Now think about that. Think about that as we think about the story of the spread of our Christian faith over the past two millennia. As Christ followers and as lovers of God, Christianity has done so much good in the world, hasn't it? That is our story. We should celebrate that, we should acknowledge that, and we should claim it. Because it's compelling for people to come to know the saving love of God through Jesus Christ. But our story, our Christian story, like most stories, comes with the good and with the bad. 
for all the Salvation Armies and Habitat for, hum for Humanities, for all the Underground Railroads and all the Cory Tin Booms, and of course, for all of our personal witness in word and deed of a saving God who never stops loving us and pours grace over us through the love and sacrifice of Jesus. For all of that, Christianity has also been culpable in some pretty bad parts of history. And we need to claim that as well as part of our history. And we need to acknowledge it. Because if we try to shut it out and forget about it and pretend it hasn't happened, then we never learn. And we never grow into the Christ followers that we are called to be. At its worst, Christianity has been either at the front of or behind the scenes of some pretty horrific, pretty isolationist, pretty elitist, pretty violent events that can arguably be described as defending our tribe. From the Crusades to the Inquisition to Manifest Destiny to the forced Americanization and education of Native American children, to ch chattel slavery in the, in the Americas, to the Sand Creek Massacre in Southeast Colorado, to Hitler's Nazi regime fueled by Christian nationalism. Christianity and Christian theology has been a driving force or the theological justification used to endorse all sorts of violent and aggressive and oppressive and decidedly unchristlike events in the last 2,000 years of human history. When, how did Jesus' countercultural gospel of peace and reconciliation, of unity but not uniformity, morph into such attitudes and such events as these? Now, one could argue that it all stems from a tribalistic mentality that is, an, as, that is inherent in our DNA. And that is still prevalent in today's postmodern societies, especially in our Western culture. Culture is going through a huge paradigm shift. And that includes the church. The church, in particular, is in a very stressful, very painful throes of this shift. McLaren points out lots of people notice that religion often inspires violence. We may say more accurately, he says, that tribalism inspires violence and religion supports tribalism. But lots of people, especially young people, especially educated people, feel like religion is a part of the problem. And they're staying away from religion because they don't want to be a part of a tribe that's hostile toward other tribes. And they feel that we're at a point in history where we need to learn to work together, to get along, to collaborate, to face the challenges that face all of humanity. Now, does that sound like a radical thought? It shouldn't. But the truth is, much of our Christian history has been, if we think about it, very tribal. In their book, Untamed, Alan and Deborah Hirsch wrote, the more religious we get, the more exclusive we tend to become. Now, as we listen to the story from Mark this morning, it is clear that Jesus recognized this human tendency too, the tendency to be tribal, to be exclusive, to protect and strengthen our comfortable religious practices, our own space in the world, and our own place in it. And Jesus pushed back. Jesus always pushed back on ideas and practices, traditions and theologies that minimized God's grace and restricted God's expansive love for all of God's good creation. And this does beg, beg the question, as McLaren put it, what is religion for? Is it for creating a little us group that, uh, that's opposed to, to them, to the other groups? over there that live and exist in this world? Mark records how the disciples came up to Jesus. And if you kind of listen to the, the tone of that text, you get the sense that, that they're filled with this, this self-importance and self-righteous impudence. And they come up to Jesus and they report this thing and they're seeking Jesus' Jesus approval. They're seeking his attaboys. But that isn't what they get. Hey, Rabbi! This guy over there, he's, he's confronting these evil powers. He's casting them out. He is actually casting them out, but he's using your name. 
And he's not one of us. He's not a part of us. So we told him to stop. Told him to knock it off. And they're waiting on his approval. But to, to their surprise and probably to the, their dismay, Jesus responded, what did you do that for? Come on, guys. Don't stop him. Anyone who is not against us is for us. We're not looking for enemies to compete with. We're looking for allies. We're trying to bring people together. We're looking not. We're not looking for who to cut off and reject. We're building a movement. We're not building a club. And he may not be in our group, but he understands the power of God that I am sharing with everyone. And he simply cannot use my name for good and then turn around and use my name for harm. We're on the same team. We're working for the same goals. So don't you dare put a stumbling block in front of. Don't you dare criticize or trip up or make things harder for one who believes in what I'm doing and loves what God loves too. And then Jesus says what seems like this is the icky part. Jesus said what seems like some pretty harsh words, some hard instructions, easily misunderstood words. Now, I believe that he said these words for a purpose and that they were harsh because just like, you remember last week, this is, this, this is what comes next in the text from what we read last week. Right after, he pulled that little child into his arms to emphasize extreme humility now he's saying these harsh words just immediately afterwards. I think Jesus is trying to convey a very, very important message. A message that was concerned with our propensity to close ranks and judge and exclude and even express violence toward other individuals or groups or religious beliefs that don't align with ours. And Jesus said, you know, if your own hand... If your own foot, if your own eye causes you to stumble and causes this other one to stumble, cut it off, poke it out, amputate it. Doesn't sound very Jesus-like, does it? I don't think Jesus, though, was calling for self-mutilation. I think that he was a calling attention to what holds our attention to how we become so fixated and obsessed on what that other guy or that other denomination or that other religion or other political party or other gender or other you fill in the blank is doing or believing or practicing or voting or living that is different from us. And Jesus is saying, look, your enemy is not over there. Your enemy is inside of you, your own hand your own foot, your own eye. What's so important? What's so distinctive about our hand? What does it suggest? Well, it's your actions, your strength, your skills that can so easily cause either good or cause harm and hurt. What about your foot? Well, your foot, it motivates you. What motivates you? What drives you? What moves you? What takes you places for your own good or for the good of others? Your eye. How do you see the world? What's your outlook, your perspective, your assumptions, your worldview that when not careful can cause you to marginalize and disenfranchise and reject others? Our greatest enemy is not over there. Our real enemy is here. And it's here. It's that part of me, or that part of you, part of us, that wants to make them bad and me good. Them outside and me inside. Them enemy and me elite. Don't try to purify or eliminate or change them. That's what the language of salt and fire is all about. No, we must focus our own on our own, we must focus on our own desires, our own drives, our own biases, and let the salt and the fire purify what's going on inside of each of us. We simply must focus on ourselves, our own issues, because that's where we begin to break down the walls of the tribes. We begin with ourselves. 
because we're still building tribes. We're still hijacking our faith to build our defensive walls. We're still creating idols of theology and ideology, and we're circling around them to justify, at the least, closing ranks, or at the worst, to justify our hatred and our bias and our hostility. And we're creating and perpetuating this, this us versus them mentality, and we're hanging on to it for all we're worth. We told them to stop, Jesus. Aren't you proud of us? Because they aren't like us. They don't worship or believe or live or understand you like we do. So we told them to stop, to move on. They don't belong here. And Jesus said to us, why'd you do that for? Don't tell them to stop. We're not about creating enemies. We're not about building a club. We're about cultivating a kingdom. And we cannot cultivate God's kingdom. We can't embody God's love for all as Jesus said we're supposed to do, and how we're supposed to love, if we're always closing rank and judging and excluding and seeing God's good creation as existing for our benefit and our comfort and our consumption. When we stand apart, when we isolate and reject and come against one another, when we refuse to stand in partnership with one another, in spite of our differences, because for some reason, we can't seem to recognize the, the fingerprint of the Creator God in those who are different from us. Then who loses? Who is harmed? They are. And we are. And heaven knows our children are. Because what are we leaving them? Everyone, everything is harmed. Because all of good's creation is harmed. 100,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, even 5,000 years ago, human beings, whenever they had conflicts, they could spread out farther and farther and farther around the globe. But there's no spreading out anymore. We have quite well, as it says in Genesis, gone forth and multiplied. More so than mitochondrial Eve could ever have thought possible. We have fully inherited the earth. And there is nowhere else to go on this blue marble in God's creation. We simply must listen to Jesus. We must see God's imprint in all of our neighbors and cultivate partnership with our others for the good of all of God's good creation. We must work for the well-being of all of God's children and all of the beautiful inhabitants of this earth. For if we don't, who will? We are the headwaters of God's rivers of justice. And alone, if we just stand alone with our own tribe, we are but a tiny drop. But when we work in partnership with others, that drop becomes a stream. And then when we join with other streams, it becomes a river of justice. Justice that looks out for one another, cares for one another. Justice that doesn't stand for the few extreme wealthy to thrive at the expense and the neglect of the poor. Justice that cares for those forced to flee their homelands. Justice that refuses to hold different race and ethnicity and nationality, different bodied and different abled, different age and gender and loves, different spirituality and education. Doesn't hold any of those things, those differences, and those people is less than. Justice that intentionally works to protect the land and the sea and the varied environments that not just us, but animals and plants and all our very biodiverse world calls home. Jesus is challenging us to see things in a new light. He didn't come to fracture the world and to yet another hostile religion, another hostile tribe. Jesus came to bring unity and reconciliation a beautiful partnership that cares for all of God's good creation and all living things that call it home. Jesus came and proclaimed a kingdom, a huge, wholesome, W-H-O-L-E, whole, made up of many diverse and magnificent parts and loved completely by God. By proclaiming a kingdom, Jesus is inviting us to defect from our little tribal hostilities and become part of something better, 
the best something. Something peaceful and reconciled and bigger and inclusive. Even including that guy over there who's casting out evil forces but not doing it with us or like us. What kind of religion are we going to follow? What kind of good creation are we going to cultivate? What kind of Christ followers are we going to be? Let us pray. Good creator, we long to follow Christ fully in all ways. We yearn to be your image bearer, your caregiver, not in our way, but in your way. We want to live in partnership with any and all, even those who are so very different from us, so that your creation, your stunning, beautiful creation that we all live in and are a part of thrives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As the ushers come forward to prepare for our offering time, I want to invite you to take a look toward the center aisle on the end of the pews where you'll see a, a black friendship folder inside. There's some welcome slips. Uh, whether you are a longtime member or a first-time visitor or a, a regular visitor, we invite you to fill out the welcome slip uh, to put either your contact information or update it if you have new contact information from what you know is in our records. Um, if you do that, we would appreciate it. For those who are first-time visitors, this is not to stop you or to, to do anything to make you feel uncomfortable, but you might get a, a personal note from either Lee or I, that, and, and just we want to know, we want you to know that you are welcome here. So if you could do that when you're done filling it out, if you could pass it down, and the last person on the row, if you could just leave it on the end, and they will be picked up later. In our scripture passage today, we heard how Jesus talked about our ability to do either good or to do harm. And it seems that we can do good through, through simple things. Things like giving a, a, simply a, a cup of water to someone who's thirsty, for instance. We can also do harm sometimes when we're not even intending to. So what does this mean for us as stewards of God's good creation? Are we seeking to do good with what we have? Or are we being careless with what we have been given? As a church, we must reflect on these questions. And as individuals, we must reflect on them too. And as we have the opportunity now to give of our financial gifts, I invite you to give with hope that by sharing what you have received, God will create even more goodness here and in this community and in this world. Now, you have various ways that you can give this morning as the ushers pass the offering plate. You can put, put your offering into the plate. But if you'd like to go online, you can do so. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or online, you can go to fumcloveland.com and go to the Give and Support tab, and it'll take you to a secure giving page, and you can give that way. Or if you're online or here, you can, there's a QR code there. It's there. It's on the pew in front of you, and it is also on the bottom. For those of you who picked up a worship order on the bottom of that page, you can just point your camera to it, and it'll take you to that same secure giving page. However you choose to give. Your generosity makes God's work possible through this church, and it is a blessing. So thank you.
Amen. Let us go to God. God of all good things, we rejoice with gladness in all you have given us. Receive this offering as a symbol of our gratitude. Use it to your will and with your spirit empower us to be good stewards, not just of the earth, but all we are entrusted with to co-create your kingdom on earth. Receive us also and transform us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our sending song this morning is Are You Able? We will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. I invite you to stand as you're able to sing our sending song. Um, If you're following along in the hymnal, it's on page 530-530. Let us sing together. to go out we will say again our benediction together as one body and one voice we are going to be borrowing this morning a benediction from the chinook psalter let us let us speak together bless the wisdom of the holy one of us bless the truth of the holy one beneath us and bless the love of the holy one within us go in peace Thank you.